Thank you for joining us today. We are standing in the Montana Historical Society Museum amongst the Stockman's exhibit. We've got sheep wagons, we have branding irons, we have everything you can imagine to tell the story of ranching in Montana. Sheep and cattle ranches are vital to Montana and ranching history is about the Stockman searching for their own version of gold, Montana grasslands. As early as 1841, St. Mary's missionaries imported cattle and sheep from Fort Colville, northwest of what would be Montana Territory. From the Oregon Trail, south and east of what would become Montana, Deer Lodge's Johnny Grant acquired animals exhausted from their 2,000 mile trek. After resting and feeding on Montana grasslands, he sold the animals back to pioneers for a profit. And after seeing Montana's abundant grasslands in 1865, Poindexter and Orr moved all of their huge cattle and sheep operation from California permanently to Montana's Beaverhead. Nelson Story and his crew were the first to bring cattle south up into Montana using the dangerous Bozeman Trail. And then later, many of the larger outfits, such as the XIT, would be bringing cattle up from Texas and the southern part of the country. They would be fattening them up on eastern Montana grass and then put them on the railroad. As people are coming in from the east, the west, the south, there's a lot of competition for land and grass. And this pushed the stock into central Montana, making the whole of central Montana territory open range. That is, a large area of grazing land without fences or other barriers. Men like Granville Stewart and James Fergus established themselves in central Montana, while a growing number of new ranches were controlled by large corporations, including European investors. The near extinction of buffalo in the 1880s by overhunting and disease actually made for less competition for the grass. But this era marked the pinnacle of the open range era. By 1885, Montana stockmen were politically powerful, and the legislature that year was known as the Cowboys Legislature because they passed several laws in support of stockmen, particularly laws to hinder rustling. And believe me, rustling was alive and well in central Montana. Frustrated cattlemen had turned to vigilantism to protect their herds. Extreme weather conditions from 1885 through 1887 hindered grass growth. Thousands of cattle and sheep froze or starved to death. The overgrazed free range could no longer support the vast number of cattle and sheep who were dependent on it. And probably the best depiction that we can imagine for this era and for this terrible, harsh time is Charlie Russell's sketch, Waiting for a Chinook. Can you imagine being that poor steer surrounded by wolves? And following the 1886 and 87 winter, ranchers took new approaches to sustain their businesses. The number of smaller ranches increased because so many of the larger outfits had gone out of business. They had lost all of their stock. And sheep business increased. It seemed as though they were less affected by Montana's harsh weather than the cattle. Ranchers like Henry Sieben and Charlie Bear made the best of sheep production. And shockingly, by 1900, Montana was the nation's number one wool producing state. These owners depended on experienced sheep herders, many who were immigrants, and they often lived in sheep herders' wagons for months on end to protect the sheep and to help them locate fresh grass. Now, can you imagine spending the winter in here? By the 1900s, most surviving ranches had committed to growing winter feed to protect their stock from Montana's winters. Dozens of ranchers, believe it or not, turned their ranches into dude ranches so that they had tourist dollars to help them pay for the ranch and the business. This is about the time that Montana has the homestead boom from 1890 through 1917. That's when the federal government opened vast tracts of land to homesteading and the removal of First Nations peoples to reservations opened up even more land. The railroads brought tens of thousands of hopeful settlers. Following a decades-long boom in agriculture, drought and depression came to Montana, much earlier than it did the rest of the country. Surviving ranchers once again learned new approaches to ranching. The Montana legislature was progressive as it took steps to protect public grasslands. Passing legislature in 1935 and 1939 that would create state cooperative grazing districts and encourage statewide communication and management. By 1940, the average ranch grew over doubling in size from 360 acres to 1,000. 
This allowed for more grazing and pasture land for each head of stock. Hard times also encourage ranches to try new technology. Tractors to assist with harvest, balers, of course the ubiquitous pickup, but working animals gave way to gasoline powered machines. As the world recovered from World War II and became more consumer oriented, Montana meats sold worldwide. Industry did have a slowdown in the 1970s and 80s as stockmen adjusted to the changing world economy and competitive markets. And they adjusted, bracing new approaches to ranching and grasslands. In short, ranchers not only worked at calving and lambing and haying, they are scientists as they care for grasslands and stock, diplomats who maneuver through current government regulations, and businessmen who manage product development. Montana ranchers and her golden grasslands have undergone a lot of booms and busts, but they always evolved to survive, always playing an important role in Montana's economy as well as her history. I can't thank you enough for joining us today, talking about Montana and her wonderful history. This is Zoanne Stoltz. I'm reference historian for the Montana Historical Society. 